You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Hello, friends. Today we continue the ninth series of Wilding with my guest, Dr. Christoph Balzer, a curator and art scholar with a focus on post-colonial theory and the emergence of museums in the 19th and 20th century. Thanks so much for chatting with us today. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to Marta and Kapir Shari for the invitation. To begin our conversation, I'm curious how you and Marta came to know each other and how you influence each other's work. Well, Marta is a BIPOC dance artist and curator from Colombia, and we both know each other here from Berlin um, since we have a shared interest in the restitution of pre-Columbian cultural heritage to their traditional owners. And this Shared interest um, has a focal point in Berlin's notorious Humboldt Forum in the rebuilt palace of Kaiser Wilhelm II, where colonially acquired objects um, from um, various uh, colonial contexts are being presented as ethnographic objects. So that is a very violent situation that is... Um, at the core of Marta's and my shared interest in this place and in what's going on there. Mm. I recently visited the Humboldt Forum and mm -hmm. at the entrance of the African exhibition, there was an add-on installation stating, I have a white frame of reference and a white worldview. And to me, this felt to be an attempt to show this transparency perhaps about the violence of colonialization. And then as I continued through the exhibition, towards the end, the same exhibition style was present. There were sacred artifacts in glass vitrines and with a plaque stating a date, placing this object in an idea of something very primal and basic and ancient. Can you talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. for people that might be confused with these two very juxtaposing exhibitions? Mm -hmm. Maybe just to give a quick idea of what it looks like. So the Humboldt Forum is, an, is a new ethnographic museum in a rebuilt palace of the German Reich and German imperialism. And that in itself is already um, um, quite controversial. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, um, a long history of debate about this new project that was planned after the wall came down, but was more or less um, designed by um, a German... Um, majority society of white people without the consultation of people of color and black people and the interest groups that are being represented in this new ethnographic museum. So that has a 30-year uh, history of debate and design in itself that is very controversial. And ever since the Humboldt Forum as a new ethnographic museum opened its doors to the public um, the, the criticism of activists and scholars has um, has reached new heights and because of that I think the designers of this place and the curators and the directors of this place decided that they had to react to it and they put a specific um, um, kind of mission statement like uh, extra add-on exhibition in front of their ethnological 
presentations. And whilst on the inside, nothing has changed um, in the face of criticism, and whilst they still present colonial loot and um, keep on inviting um, um, a, a, the public and um, the, 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 yeah, the general public to look at this colonial loot um, from, a, from the point of view of a curious spectator, and while they even present human remains from um, pre-Columbian societies, they have this new add-on exhibition that says, I have a wide frame of reference. And that is in itself um, so um, typical for institutionalized whiteness, for institutions that try to hide their own biases um, underneath diversity campaigns and slogans that um, I find it um, um, actually appalling. And I'm a bit ashamed to see that the criticism has only been accepted on a very superficial level and not um, on an institutional level. What really struck me when moving through the museum was also that, in a way, it's really the ultimate worlding construction machine. This idea of meaning making, and as they say, it is a white frame of reference. It's on a white wall, quite literally, with a white placard that puts it on a very linear timeline and also presents it in a way that is in English. It's short text, it's text that implies you need a certain education to understand and interpret the information. And to quote Donna Haraway, a cultural theorist who has almost been a ghost companion throughout this series, it really does matter what matters, think matters. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with it matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. And I think this is really something else to look at, like who is moving through that exhibition, who is that exhibition for and who is framing it. The word worlding resonates very strongly here. The museum is a machine, as you said, that takes something out of the world and um, puts it through a very complex aestheticization process mm -hmm. in order to make it um, an object that can be looked at. And that object in itself is already historical per se because aestheticization leads to a loss of function and not only context, but to its functionality. So the things that we put in museums that were not made for museums like artworks, but the things that were made for, let's say, religious contexts, they are being stripped of their complex aesthetics and reduced to a mere visualistic aesthetic. So everything that um, requires touch, dance, and many other forms of cultural production and reproduction are just mere shadows of themselves when we um, perceive them in an aestheticized way in the museum. So what the museum presents is not um, an object of a foreign culture, but it's a mirror of ethnographic discourse and ethnographic perception of reality. And that reality in itself cannot be repaired or, or um, supplemented by adding new context to the museum, to the ethnographic museum with video displays and maybe even the, the occasional... Um, spiritual performance by traditional owners. The museum is a 
is a place where things are isolated and are presented as merely visual um, offerings to an audience. And you cannot change that and you cannot decolonize that because that is a colonial approach per se in the context of the cultural heritage that the German Reich has um, taken from other societies. I do not want to blame the museum per se. I love museums. I, I do. Mm. And that being said, when we look at, um, to, uh, uh, I don't know, um, toy museums or cultural history museums where people have given the objects freely and willingly, I love those places. But the Humboldt Forum is not such a place. And what I want to say, what, what is really interesting about the museum as a worlding machine is that it's a colonial worlding machine. And this is, um, I mean, to me personally, um, worlding is part of um, the, um, the tool set of post-colonial theory. I think it's a word that derives from Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's uh, post-colonial theory, right? Mm. So that's so she described worlding as a process that uh, British uh, military experts and I don't know colonizers did when they measured the country and drew maps and uh, and gave new names to places. So that is a worlding technique, and that's the same thing that's been that's happening when we still present colonial loot in museums, and you can call them ethnographic objects, you can refer to them as art objects, it doesn't matter. It's an epistemological uh, worlding process that recoins something as something else. We do not look at other people's culture in an ethnographic museum, we look at the knowledge of ethnographers and the statements that they make with objects that they made ethnographic. It's as simple as that and it's as complex as that. Mm. I want to linger a little bit on the topic of time because also the way the artifacts are being displayed at the moment is also on a Western chronological time and the objects themselves, when I speak with collaborators from Tanzania who are working very closely with the Vinyago masks, the idea is that these objects are timeless, they're ongoing, they're alive, as well as some of the deities and sacred objects that you've spoken about. Can you share a little bit what this does in terms of colonization and also upholding this Western perspective of advancement and enlightenment and progress? There is a very precise differentiation between ethnographic museums and art museums. They were both created to present the cultural products of the world in a segregated way. So while white people from Europe presented their cultural products in art museums since the founding of museums in the 19th century, we decided that everything else needed to be presented in ethnographic museums, particularly without authorship, without naming authorship. And that was only possible through the regular process of making museum objects through aestheticization. We take something out of the world and by, maybe by force, maybe not, maybe we find it, I don't know, but we take something out of the world and make it an aesthetic object. And that in itself is a differentiation, a segregation of world cultures in two different institutions that is still valid today. And the museums are very aware of uh, their complacency in the colonial project, particularly ethnographic museums, 
less the art museums and the ethnographic museums tried to change that by adding context to their decontextualized collections, maybe through traditional owners who can tell what the things are or through contemporary artists who try to reimagine what those things were or what they could be today. On the other side, many contemporary artists try to work around ethnographic museum collections as starting points for their works on identity politics and memorial culture. So we have two different institutions that are aware that they have something to do with colonialism and colonial continuities. But the ethnographic museum as an institution And for example, the Humboldt Forum as an ethnographic museum cannot be decolonized because it still has ethnographic object collections that were collected to, to demonstrate that BIPOC societies are inferior to um, white societies. That was the original plan. The plan had been that everything that everybody outside of Europe had produced must be more primitive compared to the modern European nations. And we had collected um, the, the cultural treasures of other societies in order to modernize us. And I think this is a discourse that is um, still not even in, not enough discussed um, in academia because it demonstrates that modernity um, has always been influenced by a European white racism and required primitive societies to feel that modern. And we cannot get that out of the institutions like ethnographic museums and art museums. It will always remain their heritage. The whole debate on decolonization of colonial museums is, is a fallacy in, in this sense. It cannot be achieved. It can only be worked with but the museums demonstrate um, with, with mission statements and this exhibition, this, this white, a critical whiteness exhibition at the Humboldt Forum, which states, I have a white frame of reference, uh, famous Robin D'Angelo quote. They demonstrate that they do the work, that uh, they are in a process of decolonization, that they try to listen now. But what is there to, what's there to change? It's the institution that needs to go. They need to close that institution. They need to close the ethnographic museums and find a completely new approach to dealing with this kind of heritage because it's not possible to present something as, as violent as a, as a simple ethnographic object to an audience that doesn't understand what this entails. I think it's immoral to do that. Mm. As you're talking, I'm kind of unraveling what that process could look like, and it resonates with coming from Australia, which is a colony of the British. Mm -hmm. And I have a very strong memory of the official apology by the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in 2008 to the Indigenous Australian people. Mm, me too. When he expressed regret for past government policies that resulted in the forced removal of Indigenous children from their families. And this very emotional, very charged moment after years of the former Prime Minister, John Howard, refusing to stay it and very active protesting from 
a very large community, also a European community. And then this process of financial recompensation, programs to locate lost families, counselling services. How do you see a process like this playing out? There's one thing to return the objects. I think we all agree, definitely I agree, and I can feel you agreeing too that these objects need to be returned. But then what what happens then? Imagine a museum like a state museum, like the Humboldt Forum, would agree that it is a colonial institution, even a neo-colonial institution, which it is. The state would uh, have to um, acknowledge that it cannot uphold its own hegemony if the museums which uphold the cultural hegemony um, already say sorry the state has to say sorry as well so they are um, complacent in the upholding of a colonial hegemony of a colonial cultural hegemony all over the world the museums will not simply say we're sorry they will avoid this and they will only occasionally work together with politicians to acknowledge what had happened or something like that because it would cost the government too much in reparations because restitution and reparation goes hand in hand. Indigenous societies from post-colonial nations know that. That's why they demand land back, cultural heritage back, stolen wages back. It's all intertwined. And we who criticize the Humboldt Forum say that everything that it does, even its um, occasional restitutions, are part of a larger approach to maintain Germany's cultural hegemony because they cannot um, sit it out. You can, they cannot um, wait until uh, people are no longer furious because people are very furious when they look at the way that other cultures are being misrepresented by um, curators, by politicians. And that in a city like Berlin where... There are so many people from so many nations together and where we have these debates and where we try to find ways to deal with the traumas of the past in all our various positionings. And then um, at the same time are being ignored by the government. That is in itself... Um, something that makes me not so much angry anymore, but it makes me so sad because I realize that we are so far away from reappraising colonialism, German colonialism in this country. We are very far away from that. Mm. I think listening to you speak and also thinking through this idea of connection between museum and state, there seems also to be this point of blame. Like, who is to blame? How do we remove the blame? I think imagining myself, for example, as an administrator within the Humboldt Forum, how then to be within that position and take agency. And somehow for me in this process, it, it kind of comes to this, like where where does that decision-making lie and then from there steps can be made? Mm. Do you think it needs to be an entire shift in a system at once? I know at the Humboldt Forum there are processes in place to return colonial loot and there were also one or two replicas within the museum as an experiment of 
can we present replicas and have the originals with the communities that created them and that they hold sacred value to? Is this a pathway that you can see being possible, moving us forward? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Definitely not. Um, and my criticism doesn't go so much to the curators because I don't want to be in their shoes. They have to look at the structural integrity of organic matter. They may, they have to really um, preserve everything for future generations because the object knowledge is everything that they can, um, they can preserve. And so they have to serve their institution, the museum on the one hand. And on the other hand, they have to serve the people that they represent with these collections and these collection objects. And they have to really work with communities who want their stuff back while at the same time have, they work for the institution that doesn't want to return anything. So these people are in a very, very problematic situation. And what I want to see is that there are better institutions um, that replace ethnographic museums. And that's why many people claim that the, the Humboldt Forum needs to be defunded, like the police needs to be defunded. Well, the police is, an, is a colonial institution and the ethnographic museum is also a colonial institution. And while both are supposed to be defunded, nobody says that there should be no other better institution that replaces them. The, what, whatever that means for the police, I want to suggest that an ethnographic museum can only be reframed as a memorial site where violence is happening, not has happened, is it's happening now uh, on many levels, on, on so many levels. And we have to reframe that and we have to find a better form of uh, representation of such places than singular individuals like the curators who um, have this double mission. We need more or less something like um, councils, restitution councils, decolonization councils that um, work independently from these institutions and um, can take up ad advisory functions, for example, and, and step by step take over such institutions. But at the moment, whatever they offer, whatever solution the museums offer, they are not adequate. If they replace ethnographic objects with copies, it's great for the continuation of the project of the ethnographic museum. But the ethnographic museum is a project that should not be continued. It needs to be stopped. And that is um, something I think that um, we need to understand. We cannot blame the people inside. They try to do their best, but it cannot work. I'm very curious hearing you speak what this future institution could look like. You've mentioned advisory councils, some form of consultation, a process of decolonization. Is there a site where this could be held or do you see this as being more a nomadic knowledge sharing community? Mm -hmm. Here in Germany, we have a very, a very positive memorial culture when it comes to our own history of violence. So, for example, what we did with concentration camps is something I um, find very, very valuable and important to the way we perceive our own history and our own identity. So... Just like 
the the original function of concentration camps was decommissioned or taken away and how and the way that these places were made into memorial sites we need to work with museums as places of violence epistemic violence and we need to reframe them as places of violence that means that colonial museums can remain museums but they must um, pursue a different mission and while at the moment they try to reimagine ethnographic collections as something positive i would argue that these former colonial museums or neo colonial museums need to reframe themselves as museums of colonialism they can, they need to redirect their gaze that they um focused on others on the others and redirect it at themselves at their own institutionalized whiteness at that what is currently invisible i got very excited as you were talking and it might sound a little bit off topic but i was imagining a beehive and this place of activity and if it became because I definitely agree through our conversation that replicas are not possible we return the objects and I I really appreciate this idea of the museum staying a site of violence that is open to the public I think also of the Reichstag where they have now the glass dome on top of the state building in Berlin the parliament so it becomes transparent but within there this process of communication of returning objects of stories coming forward it could be like a site of healing actually and i'm still not sure whether that needs to happen in germany or whether those beehives could be moved like maybe the museum itself then becomes empty the shell of something and that work is done closer to home because also this idea of returning objects is very costly and insisting that people come to germany to prove that this is their object is also another threshold and racist barrier to do with elitism and capitalism so perhaps we need to set up beehives in different locations where we can return return stolen goods which is done in australia for example yes and no rio tinto the mining company still has a bunker of wall paintings that they've taken and placed somewhere else so they can continue with their mining so yeah it's true yes and no mm. Mm. as part of this podcast I'm inviting guests to share a proposition with myself and listeners so we can experience your research in our body. Mm-hmm. I understand you come from a curatorial background, so this is perhaps a step in the in the direction of movement, but is there a way we can feel into the complexity and this personal connection that we've spoken about today? I often think about those times when i visit the humboldt forum together with bipocs who have something of an invaluable um, importance to them in there like um something sacred and when we walk through there and when i um when i try to be open i feel that they have this incredible sadness in them that this is that this is just so unbelievably disappointing 
and frustrating and um, it creates a bodily experience of just not be accepted as 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 valid as a human being as equal to me for example because i for my part um i can only i can be angry and mad at them but it's not against me as a white person it's against bipoc and that's something that can be understood maybe if you try to connect with this incredible sadness of the people who are being misrepresented in places like the Humboldt Forum. Mm. It's a beautiful proposition. I'm going to invite listeners to sit with this reflection wherever you are listening to this podcast and just feel into a moment of sadness, letting you know also that BIPOC refers to Black Indigenous Person of Colour. Thank you for that proposition. It's a very complicated topic and I really appreciate you bringing it onto the podcast, Christoph. Mm. Yeah, thank you for discussing this. Is there any area or place that listeners can follow up on this conversation or somewhere that you could direct us if we're feeling that perhaps we want to go further into this topic. I would recommend you go to such an ethnographic museum and see it for yourself. And bear in mind who this was made for. And if this is still a valid proposition for the 21st century. Do it yourselves and do not expect others to do that kind of work for you and to help you understand that. I think it's a personal thing. It's a personal experience that you need to reflect on rather than an academic discourse. Feel the unfairness of it all. A child can understand this. And so can everyone else if they're open. And to continue this conversation, Christoph, who are you recommending for us to speak with in the next episode? <laughs> yes, um, I thought about it and um, I'm passing the mic to Daniela Sambrano Almidon, who is an artist and activist from the Abyayala Collective Huaca. This is a the Abyayala is the original name for the Americas, and Daniela's work revolves around the process of reclaiming stolen heritage from German museums to their places of origin, in her case, 
It's um, Chukitanta in Peru. I'm very much looking forward to that conversation. And thank you so much for being on the show and bringing this topic so to the forefront. I think it's a topic that's being spoken about a lot at the moment, colonization, post-colonialism, but what it means and what it feels like in this very dense space was very present in this conversation. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Rene. Thank you for listening to the Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.